So we've got a repeat expert coming back, Allison Knott, who has probably at least two, three times already come and shared her expertise. And we're really grateful to have her back. Today's focus is around audience research. And we're going to talk deeply about how you can say, save time and effort with your communications by doing the homework first, but not painful, no fun homework. This is going to be fun homework. And Allison will talk you through that process. So who is Allison? Allison is an international tech speaker who's passionate about the intersection of the web, creativity, business, and social impact. Her main mandate is to raise web literacy for small organizations like yours. Presentations are an unusual blend of enthusiasm, you're going to hear it, and actionable lessons. Boring tech jargon? No place here today. In addition to public speaking and running her agency, Allison also mentors female entrepreneurs and has had teaching positions at several schools. So I'm going to now pass the mic over to our great friend, Allison. I'm very excited today to come back and to see you all. So the bottom of my heart, everyone here in the chat, thank you for the good you put into the world. So welcome to a conversation about audience research to save time and effort with your communications and your marketing is small but mighty teams putting good into the world. As I mentioned, I'm really interested in this right now. When I do work with ethically aligned brands, sometimes we get really caught up in the tactics of things, right? We got to write this. We have to put out that. We have to review this. And it's all great and fantastic, but sometimes we feel like we're putting out information for information's sake. We feel like we don't really know what kind of traction it is. And ultimately, we are trying to pull people into our causes and people into our advocacy and people into our products and our services. So today, I want to talk about audience research as a way for you to really understand who you're talking to and communicating with. Now, I have today's slides and some extra goodies at this link at the bottom here, bit.ly slash AR nonprofit. And also it's going to be on every slide. So the first slides, you don't write there are darlings. So let's go to town on this. So the first thing I want to clarify is the difference between market research and audience research. So there but not they're like cousins noses but like one's five foot five and one's seven foot two right so the way i like to think about this is market research think of the word market right think of a beautiful farmer's market where you're going in as your brand and there are other brands like you inside the shared market space right so when you're doing your market research, you're really concerned about how your brand is positioned against other brands similar to you, your competitors, or how I like to call them, our contemporaries, right? We're all in this together. So your market research is your brand evaluating what other brands are doing and how you live in that ecosphere. So let's say you like peaches. I love peaches. They're delicious. And they look like little butts, which I love. So we have a, a basket here of peaches and you are a peach farmer and you're inside that market research and you want to understand how are you going to orientate your peaches? What are your peaches like compared to other pe people's peaches and all of that good stuff? Audience research is more specific. It's about the person who is looking at the fruit and going, do I even want peaches? Maybe they want a refreshing lemon. Ugh, although lemons are quite tasty. So audience research is really dialing in on, it's cool to understand what other brands are doing in your space, but how are people resonating with it? What do they want to see? What do they expect to see? What is missing for them? What do they want more of? So today my goal is to show you four different ways that you can do audience research. You can find the people who will really love your peaches, and make sure that you don't attract people who want lemons. And also make sure that people understand all the varieties and wonderness that is your peaches and what you can make with them. And it's lunchtime. So if anyone hears a fruit cup with them, then you are totally on sync for this particular piece right now, which is pretty cool. The idea behind this is sometimes when we're doing our communications and marketing, we get a little caught up on put something out and hope someone converts, right? Conversion could be they become an advocate, they become a sponsor, a donor, they sign up for something. But people's journeys with your brand is a lot more segmented. And you might have seen this before, both the customer journey, the donor journey, right? But in a nutshell, it's an awareness piece. So like 
The idea with audience research is how can we figure out what even made your audience go, hot damn, I want a peach. We get often caught up with assuming people want peaches. How did you, how can you figure out when they started wanting peaches in the first place? And then when they're thinking about peaches, to understand were there other fruits they were considering? We're thinking about vegetables. We're thinking about pre-made, pre-sliced peaches, or where they want to go and get organic and pick themselves, right? That consideration phase. What are they looking at for what you offer as a nonprofit against other nonprofits and for-profit solutions that they might be investigating? And then that conversion piece is important, right? Really understanding the part that we're familiar with, right? The comments on our socials, people signing up to this, that, and the other thing. And of course, advocacy is important for us too, right? Not only do we want people to stay with us as a brand and as a nonprofit, we want them to become little mini peach farmers just like us and go out to their farmer's markets and then say, these are the best peaches you're going to want. From, I should say at the end, the whole point of this is our audience. And today's lessons are all about gathering up that gold and taking off that fake nose and glasses and pulling back the sheet to find out exactly who your ideal audience is so that you can communicate them in amazing ways. And the benefits of doing this is, as extrapolated, it lets you focus on your client, customer, advocates, your ideal audience's journey towards your nonprofit and with your nonprofit, right? We're not getting so stuck on conversion alone or awareness alone. We're getting a more holistic, a more 3D representation of why people gravitate towards us, why they fall off, and why they stay. It reveals your true competitors and contemporaries. Often in our line, so if you're really involved in animal rights or you're really involved in sustainability and you have an offering or a service or you're part of something larger, but the end result in being in the organization, the transformation that's going to happen. So we make assumptions as to the people we want to attract that, number one, they know exactly all the same information we do. They know how it all works, and they've already known who else is out there doing the same work. But you'll find with audience research, sometimes who your contemporaries are makes no sense to you, but complete sense to your ideal audience. You might not have considered this other option because they're not a nonprofit or they're not in your province or territory. When your audience research might reveal, people go to them first and expect something and then come to you to expect something else or something else. So a true competitor and temporaries happen because your ideal audience is telling you, we're not making assumptions. And of course, all of this work will dig up content gold. You begin to understand how the work you do fits in relationship to their life the language they use, their expectations of how that's going to go. And that becomes amazing use for your strategic plan, for any of your outreach communications, for your marketing, content distribution, earned media, you named it. All of a sudden, you are trying to figure out what you think people want. They are literally telling you what they expect to hear from you and how to even say it, how to write it, how to code it, how to make it into videos, you name it. But what I love most about audience research is it's inexpensive. It can be as short or as long as a project as you want. And it doesn't matter your team size or resources. I know sometimes it feels really sexy to get an outside team to come on out and do this huge market research campaign to help you with a strategic plan. That's all great. But meanwhile, you as an individual, you as a small team of two or three or four could absolutely do some of the things in audience research that I am going to show with you today. And at the end of it all, the biggest benefit is we're communicating to the people we wish to attract in a way that resonates. We don't put ourselves in this. Our audience research points to what's truly going to make them felt seen, heard, understand the transformation, and become amazing advocates for the amazing work that you do. Essentially, what this is, measure twice and cut once with your content creation. The whole idea here is I don't want you creating things for the sake of creating it. It is much better to do some research, find out what is and isn't working, and then pull what's working from other brands and from your audience research, and then roll it into what works for your brand and make it shine, right? I don't want all these little pieces, but I know it's all out there. 
myself included, it is a daily struggle for us to get all of our communications and marketing done. But there's always pieces, right? Little pieces you didn't mean to cut off, like that extra video you made that went nowhere or that blog post you didn't finish. There's all these little bits and pieces on our floor. My hope today is I'll help you sweep that up a little bit so you just have the nice, big, juicy pieces that you want to work with. I also like to do this because I have a pet peeve with personas. And again, there's nothing wrong with having your ideal audience or one segment boiled down to one page. But the problem with most of these is they're highly fictitious. They're like busy mom, Becky. They get these cute little names and they have demographics. I don't know if you're seeing that meme kicking around about demographics, but it's something along the lines of you pick a man born in the UK in his mid 70s to early 80s, you can get Ozzy Osbourne or you can get the king. Two very different people with very different needs, wants, desires, and inclinations. But demographically speaking, they're the same, right? So I find with audience research, it adds dimensionality to these personas. You can use it to fill it out, but most personas have not actually considered real people. It's you and the team or the board or the people prior to you that gathered around for two hours, did an exercise, banged out a really nice piece of paper, but ultimately isn't real. It's not based on anybody except your hopes and dreams of an organization. So audience research can pump this up a little bit more so we get a little bit deeper than busy mom Becky or salesman Sal or whatever you want to do there. But before I get into these tactics, I do just want to let everyone know that it's important to have a goal before you start. Because if not, you could just be looking through a lot of data and just like swirling, like chasing all these different ideas around. Now, your goals don't have to be really hard and concrete. I don't believe it's effective for most small teams. Sometimes it's just a broad goal that kind of gives you an overlap of what you need, an overview. So maybe your goal is you want to have more engaged newsletter readers, right? That's going to help you focus on what you're going to look for in your audience research. Or maybe you're attracting a new audience segment. Maybe you realize you need to reach more elders or maybe you need to reach new Canadians in the work that you're doing. And you're not really sure about that new audience and you want to do right by them and ensure you fully understand what they want and need. Great reason to do this. Or perhaps you need to approach a sensitive topic in a more conscientious way. For example, whitewash or sorry, greenwashing is a huge problem happening for those of us working inside of sustainability. Or maybe you have grown as a person, as an organization and a board, and you want to be more inclusive in the work that you do. But it can be hard sometimes to figure out how you're going to word that in a way that's approachable and considerate and conscientious. So again, having that goal will help you focus on what you need to look for to help people out and make sure that you yourselves can be phenomenal in the way that you communicate. And of course, I want you to remember this is research. So Make time in your calendar. I know it's going to be so hard and it's going to feel so much more productive to go and put out stuff. But whatever meetings you have and whatever you have to draft this thing and edit this, put time in your calendar for research. If you don't get it done, it will fall off the plate and you will still be back where you started, making content from a place of assumption, out of date information, or good intentions, but not real teeth. And also, while you may echo time in your calendar, I recommend keeping a little dumping ground for brilliant little moments you come across. So for example, for myself, I have on all my browsers, I have a tab ready in Notion and one in Google Docs as well, where sometimes I'm not actually in active audience research mode for clients, but I catch something in my day-to-day -day use online and I want to do that screen cap or leave a note for myself. Sometimes the best gold nuggets come when you least expect it. So having access to Notion or OneNote or whatever your favorite platforms are, TechSoup can help you out with lots of those things too. It can absolutely help you kind of collect data as it comes up. This can be a lifelong sort of learning as it were. And of course, I really want you to pay attention to the engagement. The engagement, not so much what you think this brand is doing or how big they are or how big their team is or what their budget is or everybody already knows this brand. The point is to pay attention to the engagement you're seeing on their content, because it's not about the market research, it's about the audience research. For example, everyone knows who B-Lab is, right? I was doing research on these folk when I was doing some work with a client in the sustainability and slow fashion movement. And so, of course, we all know B-Lab, it's part of B Corp, right? Phenomenal, huge running organization. And of course, they've got 77.5 thousand followers on Twitter. So if you just looked at it from this perspective, from a marketing market research, oh yeah, they got it great. They got it going on. They got a huge representation, right? There's no way in heck that we can compete with them. We don't know what their audience wants. They're just a big brand with a big team. Here's the thing. I was doing research on them 
And they're really big, but I don't know, folks. I don't know if you noticed this, but January 10th, they released a poll, and out of 77,000 people, four people voted. And out of the four people, four of them were like, or two of them were like, I don't even like this. So this is what I mean by paying attention to audience research. If you hadn't done the engagement piece, you might say, B-Lab's got it. Cool. We're just not going to be able to compete with them. But what I'm learning from this, one of many things, of course, is a small sample, is perhaps that ideal audience is not interested in polls and maybe not so much a podcast or the way they're wording it isn't really effective for them or the group on Twitter simply aren't interested in engaging with them about their podcast. So just a little food for thought there, folks. Size doesn't matter. And we also know that B Corp is highly successful and does a lot of great work. So we got to be careful when we, even our own work, we go, oh, we only got two likes on that. Be careful about getting over comp getting overly rung up about numbers, paying attention to the engagement. Now, in case anyone's here and you're falling asleep because you're in the lunchtime slumps, I have a really important slide coming up. So I hope you got your cameras ready, you got your notebooks ready. This is the number one. This is the first way to do audience research, and it is the most important. So you all better be ready. It is, bear with me, talk to your existing audience. This is a huge one, right? A lot of us are walking around. What is it our audience wants? Allison, how do we get more effective in our communications? The first thing I'm asked is, do you ask your audience? And it's like, oh, I just, oh, but what if we that? Right, darlings, the first step is you're probably sitting on a gold mine of what your audience actually wants to listen to, but we're so busy promoting, advocating, putting out impact stories, which are great, mind you, but we're also not asking our audience questions to find out more of what they want on the platforms and other ways that they're actually engaging with us. And I also mean that I don't want you to use ChatGPT. Nothing wrong with AI, but I'm telling you, it's not ChatGPT. It's chat with your ideal audience first, damn it, darlings. And that comes from a place of love. But you are not going to get this work done by asking something that has no idea about your mandates and the select variety, beautiful things that your specific audience is looking for. So you've got to ask them. How do you ask your existing audience? You've got a lot of options, right? Social media, of course. You can run polls. You can do posts. You can do stories. You can put little stickers inside of there and get really interactive. You have your email list. You can have surveys. You can put in email replies, right? You can send out an email. And in that email, if your platform allows it, you can ask people, here are three lines and please tell us which one most reflects what you feel. They click it, it adds a tag in the back end of your newsletter system. And all of a sudden, you now know a little bit more about your audience and you segmented them. And spoiler, I do this in my own uh, little drip if you go for my goodies at the bottom. So you can actually see this in practice. It's pretty cool. If you're doing online or in-person feedback events, are there questions you could ask beyond the event or about the event that would deepen your recognition and your understanding of what your audience is looking for? Why did they come to this thing? Was there any, what was the most valuable takeaway they had? Was there anything they had hoped they were going to experience but didn't? Great ways of working with your audience research. And I want you to get creative and think beyond the obvious with this. I'm going to give you an example. So let's say that you are a nonprofit organization that works with conservation, right? Awesome, admirable, love the work that you do. And your ED or someone else on your team wants to start going on podcasts to start talking about the change and transformation you make or a really important topic that's really top of mind. So you don't know where to really start and what podcast to go on. So you go to your audience and you might say, what are your favorite podcasts about conservation? Wrong, There's nothing wrong with that question, but... I would argue that you can go a bit deeper. You might want to think about your audience and go, the most engaged audience we have are actually social impact entrepreneurs. They're really interested in conservation. And the reality is probably, there probably aren't a heck of a lot of conservation podcasts out there. If I'm wrong, please tell me in the chat. I would love to be probably wrong. I don't know all the podcasts in the world. But a better way to ask people would be, what podcasts would you recommend to other social impact entrepreneurs? Do you see the difference here? So the work was done. And if you don't know how you would have figured out if they were social impact entrepreneurs or not, continue with this, these lessons I'm dropping today, right? Because I'll show you how to find, figure that out. But what we're doing here is we're removing us from this conversation. It's not about our end goals to talk about conservation. 
we're going back through that journey that I put up earlier to the awareness piece. It's what got people interested in conservation, their social impact entrepreneurs. And we notice that when they do that, they tend to get really interested in conservation because that's their first step, right? So when you're asking your existing audience questions, don't always go right to the end result. Don't always go right to what you do. Try to reverse engineer a bit and think about how it looks like from their world. The second one that I have today is one-to-one -one interviews. And they are as they sound. This is when you are going to go and talk to your favorite, best, ideal client, customer, or advocate, right? This is a one-to-one -one conversation. And Darlings, you can do it. You can get buy-in from your ED and from your superiors and from your cohorts to help you do this. But a one-to-one -one interview, its whole idea is you want to talk to your best, favorite, best fit clients, customers, or advocates. Because the goal here is you want to understand them so you can get more of them, right? You want to replicate the success that you've had with them. And the point of the conversation, I can't emphasize this enough, is to figure out what led brand. It is not a review. It is not a product review. It is not a service review. This is not a testimonial for what your organization or company does. It's specific to figuring out what got them to turn their head and look at you in the that you can replicate and get more of them into your field. Now, often these are usually around 30 to 45 minutes and recommend connect connecting them around two weeks, right? And you want to do that within two weeks because you don't want to give it such a long time that people never get in and book into your calendar, but you want to give them enough time so they feel a sense of urgency and also want to communicate with this. And in terms of doing this, I have a really great resource. I can't recommend enough. I'm not an affiliate for this. I'm not an affiliate for anything that I mentioned today. There is a really great system called Customer Camp Clarity Calls, developed by a Canadian named Kate Burgoyne. She actually splits her time between here in Halifax and in Quebec. And what it is, is a complete system. I think it's about 129 US right now. It takes you start to finish, darlings. It tells you how to figure out who you should interview, how to ask for the interview, all of the questions you need to ask, how to take the notes while you're doing the questions and even how to organize it in a way that would fit into that journey that I showed you at the start. And I've heard some comments that people get on the landing page and go, that's not for us, this is like B2C. This is like B2C product sales. It's not. I've had great success with clients in B2C, especially B2B and especially service-based. The questions are organized in a really great way. So if you're interested in having one-to-one -one conversations with people you already know, love what you do as an organization, I strongly recommend checking out this resource or finding other ways to hold one-to-one -one interviews with your ideal audience to replicate work. It's fabulous. Like, it's a lot of fun. And it's like beautifully designed. There's lots of good, funny jokes in it. Oh, it's great. You'll love it. So what I want to talk about is performing a listening tour, which is kind of similar to the one-to-one, -one, but it's a little bit different in that you're probably not going to talk to your current clients, advocates, or customers. You're going to talk to people you're hoping to connect with, hoping to communicate with better. Tangential often, right? So they're not your current, but you're really interested in what they have. And you want to discover their experience with your specific topic, right? If it is around conservation, or maybe you work with single parents and single guardians and it's around food budgeting, right? So basically you want to discover their experience. Again, we're completely removing you and the market from this conversation. And it's all about their experience as a potential audience member. Usually these are about 30 minutes with about seven-ish questions. You can ask again, try and keep it in that 30 minute mark. They're pretty open-ended. It's all about them just understanding what they think about your world, essentially. What I found to be really useful in this and really successful is when you're trying to get strangers to have a 30-minute phone call with you, be very clear it's on a cell. Be very clear who you're looking for and what kind of information you're looking for. And I often recommend tell them that for an additional 30 minutes, if they want, you will offer 30 minutes of your time as a gift for them to pick your brain, have a conversation, have a consult with your area of expertise. So now you're giving and receiving at the same time, which feels really good. And most people I find at the end of these sessions, because you spend the first 30 minutes never talking about yourself and just talking all about them and their experience, usually when it comes to your time, they're like, I want to know what this is all about. Who are you? What are you folk all about? Which could be really, really beautiful. Some questions you could ask, not all of them, but 
this is an idea to give you an idea of what a listening tour looks like is what are your main priorities regarding X and how does it fit into the work you do or your lifestyle? We know the work that we do is very important, but we have to understand how important and which parts are to our audience we want to communicate with so that we can stop talking about things that they don't really care about and emphasize more the things that maybe we thought were less important or critical for them to understand. We want to understand what does success regarding X look like to them? Success or change or positive, right? What is it about what this particular topic is that makes them feel good, makes them feel accomplished, effective, part of something, right? Because again, we have a way that we work as organizations and companies into what we want to expect and the change we get, but we're not always, it's not always aligned with what your audience wants, especially underlying this again for listening to her, an audience that hasn't worked with you yet. They don't know half the details, right? They don't know half of what's going on here. So understanding what their idea of success looks like, you can begin to orientate your communications more around that and less around all the doing. In other words, looking at the benefits and not the features, which I'm sure some of you have heard before. Of course, what do you still struggle with in regards to this topic? Again, we get so busy doing the things and talking about the things that we know that sometimes we don't realize that we are missing entire conversations that our audience have been waiting to hear from. Perspectives that they've been waiting to hear from. Differences they're waiting to hear from. And that struggle doesn't necessarily mean a negative thing, but it could be a clarification, right? What is still, what do they still misunderstand about it? So that you can then create content and communications that helps to educate, bring awareness and bring depth to what it is they're looking for. And the biggest one that will help you out with your audience research is when it comes to this topic, where do you go to learn more? Who do you follow, look to, podcasts, YouTube channels? What is it? And this is a great question because sometimes I've done these listening tours for clients and also myself. And sometimes people give you a list of amazing influencers and brands that you should pay attention to. And sometimes they're very honest and they go, this is my job. And when I leave, I don't think about it. That's also important too, right? Because again, we don't want to ask questions of our audience that has no relationship to what they actually want to do. I want to give you an example of a listening tour from our perspective here. So this is Barry, and he runs the Happy Community Project, which its grand goal is to make communities happy by reconnecting citizens. It creates projects for citizens to make really effective, positive change in their communities without the use of government interference, funding and raising things and getting volunteers and all the complicated stuff that often stops regular citizens from making effective change in their communities. It could be change around intergenerational connectedness, around, it could be environmental, racism-based, gender-based, you name it. They've helped people around the world and communities become community advocates. So Barry developed an app recently called the Good Neighbor App. Its job, we call it the Anti-Social Social Network, is to get people to connect with their actual neighbors in their vicinity for things like needing help when they need their plants watered, or also organizing barbecues so that people come back together. And also more important things, it's all important, there is a tree that's dying in the old orchard and we need to come together as a community and figure out how we want to honor that tree, for example. So over here, you got Barry has this big, highfalutin, beautiful idea. Make communities happy. And over here, he's got an app that can help neighbors talk. Now, what does he do from a communication standpoint? Well, what does he do from a marketing standpoint? Barry had an idea. He figured that one of the best ways to talk to people is one to many, right? If you can get someone at the organizational level to herald what you're trying to do, all their members will follow. And he figured that could be homeowner association presidents and other community presidents who help organize people based on a locale. So Barry could have just went with that and started putting out content, putting out communications about this, but he didn't. Instead, Barry, bless him, literally got on the phone and sent out cold emails to presidents across Canada who were part of homeowner associations and other community associations. And because he did a listening tour, he pinpointed three main things that they were really concerned about. And he didn't come in there to say, I have a new app that will help you. That's not it. He said, I want to have a conversation about the top priorities you have with creating community within the community that you're a president of. And they said three things. They said, number one, Facebook groups and our newsletters are becoming ineffective. That's fine. Two, they were often burdened or, I guess, brought into a lot of interpersonal communications that they had hoped that the community could resolve and so that it could let, leave them more free to work on the other parts that are necessary for them as presidents. And of course, dwindling budgets to do any of this. 
So because of his listening tour, now Barry and the team have way more fodder to work with in terms of who do we reach? What podcast to podcast does Barry have to go on to? How does he communicate this particular app to people in a way that makes sense to them? So what I'm saying here, darlings, is that Barry can take Make Communities Happy in an app and be able to communicate effectively with the presidents of homeowners associations, then whatever you're trying to achieve, darlings, you can do it too. And Barry's rooting for you, by the way. We had a supper on Sunday and he said to everybody in this chat today, I'm rooting for you and thank you for doing the good work. So I want to do a little bit of testing here for that good work. I want to know, and again, the goal here isn't to say you have to do this today. And I can't see the chat, but is there anybody in the chat who's been a little, who's been inspired by the story of Barry and this doing these listening tours? And does anybody want to drop in the chat who they're looking to talk about? Surely there's about 30 of you in the chat here today. Is anybody, for example, I'm looking to talk to single parents about food budgeting. I don't even know, Eli, or anybody. Have some courage in this small little group of 30 people. Anybody want to put into a chat an idea they have for a listening tour? I'd love to hear it. No? Everyone's contemplating? I don't think things are popping into the chat here. What do we got? So we've got from, we've got one here. Nonprofits are, that are having issues with connection and conflict. So that's really? really interesting. So it actually looks like it's more organizational based. Yeah, that's fabulous. I've got another one here coming in from Karen Lee, who says, I want to talk to locals about their leisure activity. Mm -hmm. I bet that's what oh, people really do want to talk about a lot. We've got another one here about families and fitness goals. So again, I think in this kind of leisure place from Eric, we've got wants to talk to people on wait lists for community gardens. That would like to start gardening sooner. Oh, that's a, that's Eric. I love the specific, the specificity of that one. As they're all great, but that one's fabulous. That is all. Oh, it's fabulous. Love it. I've got one from Robin who says, "I'm looking to talk to nonprofit leaders about where they go to physically meet each other when they don't have an office." No, oh, oh, I love that one too. Oh, uh, one more, and then I'm gonna. I want to be present. Well, um, I'm looking to talk to schools. And other nonprofits about their client need for technology in the home. Ooh, my suggestion there is start just with schools. And I wouldn't say schools. I would be very specific to the title of the person at the school. So is it a program director? Is it a principal, vice principal, what have you? So these are all fabulous. I know. Thank you so much for being so courageous to put them in the chat. That's a great one. As a teaching moment for everybody, the more specific that you can talk about the kinds of people, the more likelihood you will get these folk in. Awesome. I love it. I do have one more and it includes a live demo. So I want to make sure. Thank you, everyone. Bottom of my heart. Well, I'm so happy to hear that you want to talk to people. And believe me, they will talk to you. It is amazing what happens when you put this out here. I have some helpful things in those slides down below to help you make that happen as an aside. Last one I want to talk about is Spark Toro. Anybody here who's taking some of my prior conversations or follows me online on LinkedIn or Twitter, I love Spark Toro. And in fact, what I want to do now is, I don't know how to stop my share. Why talk about it when I can show you? So if I do this and then this, does everyone still see my screen for Spark Toro? I can't tell. No, oh, I'm seeing your PowerPoint deck at the moment. Oh, are you? Okay. I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to share my screen. Sorry, I'm for all to get there. Spark Toro. Share. How about this? You see Spark Toro now? Perfect. Oh, okay. Darlings, check this out. Spark Toro is literally an audience research tool. You want some tech? I'll give you some tech. And they're fabulous. They are one of the most ethical marketing groups out there on the planet. And by ethical, number one. You don't have to buy a full year subscription. You can just do a month. They remind you three days before the month's up that you have a subscription coming on so you can pause it. And I just love this. But essentially what this is, it looks at over 84 million profiles across the internet and creates cross sections of what people are into. And what, what they're into, what you type into this thing is amazing. Check this out. My audience frequently talks about blank. My audience uses these, pro, these words in their profile. They follow these social accounts. They visit these websites. They use this hashtag, or you can analyze specific website or social account, which is incredible. So I am going to type in my audience frequently talks about slow fashion, for example. And I'll do a search. 
Now I've got the paid wine on here. Uh, what happened there? Oh, flashing. Flashing. Turn to the left. Flashing. Okay. So what it does is, so the free version, you get five searches and you're going to see here, it cuts it off a little bit for how you can see. And then you get 250 if you go up a level and all that good stuff. So my audience frequently talks about slow fashion. I happen to know this for a fact. So they said, we found 37,000 people that we believe talk about this. Now the numbers are great, but you don't have to be like only 37,000. Like it's a sample of a sample. And if you could talk to one tenth of these people, you'd be laughing, right? But what it does is it gives you all the top words in their bio. I think someone has their audio on if they commute. Sorry, my darlings, I have a hearing issue. So I think this one might have, perfect, thank you so much. So they have top words in their bio. They have top hashtags used. So if you're really big into Instagram, you're gonna find out what are some key hashtags you can use, frequently used phrases. And in here, and what it will show you is like how to apply this in the data. They give you lots of examples of how to put it in your persona, how to do it for display marketing ads, or just anything, your strategic plan if you want. What else does it have? What other accounts that they follow, which is incredible. And I, what I want to point out in particular is the hidden gems. Hidden gems means that these are brands or social accounts or what have you, podcasts, depending on what tab you go into where they don't have as large of a reach as some of the more established, but they have huge engagement, which could be a great group of folk that you might want to start following and then maybe actually talk to for earned media. And they have niche hidden gems. So what can we do with all of this? Let's go to the text insight, for example. So we could go in here and we could see that people that talk about slow fashion, words in their bio, it might be that you don't want to just talk to everybody who talks about slow fashion, but maybe it's photographers or maybe it's founders, right? So it's phenomenal what you can do in here to click these and then find out. My audience uses the word and profiles of photographers and find out other pieces of content that they talk about. I'm going to go back for a second here to talks about slow fashion and actually it's saved in one of my audiences, but slow fashion. I love this product so much. Let me see here. I could go into the podcast. So people that talk about slow, fa the slow fashion, what podcast do they listen or do they check out? So some of these could be obvious, some of them less obvious, right? You could pay a little bit more per month to get more of them. But often we're so stuck, again, on our circle of influence. This helps us to cross-reference other ones, right? YouTube channels that they look to, Reddits that they're on right? If we go back to social for a second, this is just incredible. You'll see here that on the social account, it will give you all their socials and their likes and followers. So you can go click this in one click to go then and see their accounts very quickly, which is phenomenal. You can save these to lists. You can narrow down a location. So we could say add location. No, this is mostly American-based data. It is worldwide, but obviously it leans American a little bit. But you could also narrow it down is to located in Canada. So now we have 1,300 or so people that still talk about this. But this is an incredible way when you're like, where does our ideal audience hang out online? It's Spark Toro Darwins that does this, which is pretty friggin' awesome. And it's just a great way to get outside of our own circle of influence. And then the idea here is, is that you would find these brands and then you would go Look at their socials, communications, their press, and reverse engineer what people are actually resonating with and what they're ignoring so that you don't make the same mistakes. It's pretty awesome. So a question I have now for the group is I would love someone, I'm going to flip over my little tab here, or maybe I'll get Eli to do this. I would wonder if someone in the chat would like me to run Spark Toro for them over the thing my audience frequently talks about. First come, first serve. All right, friends, throw something in the chat if you've got a search term you want to test out today. And be specific. All right, here, I've got a couple. I'm looking for black bears as one of the search terms. Another one here is restorative justice. Okay. And then we've got a third, which is gifts in will. Ooh, okay. So the black bear one, I'm going to explain why I didn't put it in. So something we need to think about, and Smart Toro has wonderful documentation and video examples, is we got to ensure, does your audience actually go on socials and talk about black bears? So do they wake up and go, 
black bears? Or do they talk about something else? Where are they hanging out online that proves to you that they probably would have an interest in black bears? It's not unlike, and again, I don't see the chat and I apologize if I'm really garbling up your attentions there. It's like plumbers shouldn't use Spark Toro and type in my audience talks about plumbers, plumbing, because other plumbers talk about plumbing. But you're not here to find out about market research. You're here to find out about audience research. So for the black bear person, it might make more sense for you to pick something like they follow this particular social account. And then you know that your audience who cares about black bears is actually following uh, Allison K conservationist or something that can be used. Restorative justice, I'm really interested in because I think people who are interested in it and work in it may be more likely to actually be saying this on their websites, in their podcasts and in their socials. So. I'm going to turn off Canada too, just to, just to get a nice broad search here, just to see what happens. Restorative justice. I love it. Oh, great. We've got a huge sampling here. And again, oh, the other thing too is I don't know all these people. I don't control Spark Toro. So if there are problematic things that pop up here, please absolve me of what it shows. It does not know what is good and what is bad. It simply but has a database. But we have here in different socials of who they follow. Sarah A. Carter, I'm not sure. It's, oh, see, it's Fox News and stuff. So we will be a little bit careful with that one. But we will go to text insights for a moment. So words in their bio, people who talk about this are an educator, right? They're an author, right? So maybe you want to look at those sorts of folk you know, and figure out like retired, patriot, criminal, youth-centered church services. I don't know what this means. That's not my area of expertise, but that might help you figure out like, who do you want to target, right? So if it's educators, then when you go into educators and find out what other podcasts they listen to, that will give you a better idea of educators who like restorative justice, follow these podcasts, for example. Words used, let's see. This can be really helpful. Restorative youth, criminals, community, school, restoration, annual, legal, probably pretty much what you expect. But I do appreciate going through Spark Tour because sometimes there's verbiage that you wouldn't think to use, but does come up. Let me see here. Any podcasts that people that talk about this, talk about these. So what you could do is that you could then say, I'm not sure who Sarah Carter is, and I don't know their affiliation, but you may want to then take Spark Toro and say, I want to find out people that follow the social account Sarah Carter to build an even wider idea of what it is your audience is into. So the goal of Spark Tour was it's not going to tell you exactly what kind of content and what kind of press releases and things like that to use. It's telling you what brands and folk that they follow will help you understand and then go to their content, go to their mechanisms of outreach and reverse engineer what's going to happen there. Okay, one more maybe there, Eli, one more, one more. Sure. So from our black bear friends, they've clearly cool. talked about maybe black bears getting into garbage, if that's in a more specific way to come at people's sort of experience of it. Uh, I will, but I don't think... It might so, not be the right thing. So Toro does about uh, a quarter, about 120 days. So what people talk about the last week is black, type it in. But I'm really curious. Hey, it's my account. Let's use it all up. So again, I really think that they're working through this. But I guess my question to the black bear person data show with so the data show i'm unsure the one with greg gufton that's fox news so black bears so is this like animal conservation is this artwork what is it about black bears are they buying black bears what's the black bear what's the black bear thing it's our a, a conservation theme i'm hearing from holly so i would say the conservation would be a great one to start with to find out like your audience talks about conservation and then remarkable people so here's okay i don't know much about remarkable people but there's something about this features interviews of remarkable features such as jane goodall etc right so what we're trying to figure out here is again black bears are your amazing important mandate but people may not wake up necessarily to black bears they may wake up to conservation or black bears, but when they go to Google, they don't know what they're typing and they're getting information about how big black bears are, if and when they hibernate and all that good stuff. Here, just making up this example here, my darlings, and I appreciate your patience. Perhaps Guy Kwaski's Remarkable People does a lot of interviews with people making effective change. We know Jane Goodall and the work that she's done with apes. 
So it's possible that you might want to consider asking your audience what podcasts they listen to that helps them understand the conservation world better. Or what websites feature groups that do conservation. You could use it this way instead. And again, for Coral, you're not going to just type in one term and get all your answers. It takes some time. I wonder here, like text insights. Let me see here. Authors, consultants, founders, managers, developers, designers, co-founders, financial. So there could be some people in here that are your target audience, right? We're not for everybody. We're not. Or more to the point, it's hard to communicate when you're communicating for everybody. But there might be someone like maybe co-founders are important to you because co-founders own companies and companies sponsor more for your work than individuals. Again, I apologize. I can't see the chat and I'm making some big leaps of interpretation here. Yeah, there's a, do you want to, there's a couple other things that are coming in. I've also got a question coming in from the audience. The only thing is that we've got five minutes and I still have three slides left. So oh my gosh. Okay. So let's run it's, through those three feels. slides. I'm going to come back to Robin's question at the end. Oh, I love it. I love it. So can we now see my PowerPoint? Not yet. No. <laughs> oh, the best laid plans of mice and Allison's. Okay. Hold on. Stop sharing. I'll share my screen. And again, I appreciate everyone for putting this forward. I know I'm trying to put a lot into a little five pound bag here today, but we'll just finish this all up. How's that? Now can we see our kids in the hall reference? Success. Okay, perfect. There she goes. See you later, braces. Okay. So no matter what approach you do here, what are you going to do with all this awesome intel, right? The first thing is, I want you to go check out their content. I want you to follow their accounts, sign up for their newsletters, get in on their forums, their groups, right? Don't go in there and just start advocating for all the things you're doing, but pay attention to what is resonating with your shared audience, right? The point here is to figure out their audience is probably similar to yours and you wanna see what people are engaging with and what they're ignoring. You wanna see how they're talking about a topic that maybe you hadn't thought of talking about it before. Is there a way they're talking about it? Are they using examples? Are they using video? Figure out what is actually getting engagement for people. And a big one, one of the best ways for us to grow an audience is not to grow our own. It's to attach ourselves to someone else who already has established the audience we seek. So looking with who they hang out with and what SparkToral delivers, you can find opportunity for what we call earned media. Opportunities to collaborate such as guest posts, opt-in swaps, maybe you want to sponsor their event or newsletter or all kinds of things like that. So the job is to find out what they tell you and then go up pay attention to these brands that they have told you all about and why they love them so much. So we'll get into the questions with darlings. Thank you so much. If you've enjoyed today's talk, then you can get today's slides at that little link there, AR Nonprofit. As well, if you wish to opt in optionally, I will give you my seven questions that I use to do a listening tour. I've also created a series of Canva templates so you can just slap in your colors and your logo and your preferred background to actually start advocating, letting people know that you're doing listening tours and you've caught me at a good time. Right now, I'm doing a series of talks about audience research. And for anyone that wants to opt in to my newsletter today, there is a chance for you to win a $500 Mighty Marketing Session where I get to hang out with you for two hours and we can work on anything related to your marketing communications, SEO, audience research, email marketing, messaging, how to raise donor awareness, you name it, we got it. So darlings, mwah, mwah, mwah. I have exactly two minutes to spare. I will stop my share. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, folks. Thank you so much for your time and for putting all the good in the world and happy audience gold digging. Lovely. Thank you so much. So before we let you go, I want to get, get a question coming in from Robin Welsh, who asks, looking at all the words that were coming out of Audience Toro, can we look at these words that our audiences are using and can that actually be fed into our SEO strategy? Yes, <laughs> I didn't want to bring up the old SEO conversation, but absolutely it can, right? It can, when you look at people's websites, maybe you want to turn on the find function and see how they're talking about this. It can be useful for SEO. Of course, SEO works best with search intent. So keywords don't mean a damn thing unless you understand why people are using those words but effectively it can absolutely be for that. I found with clients, they'll realize that they keep saying, we help business owners. And then Spark Toro and other audience research points out their ideal audience refers to themselves as founders. 
go into all your marketing and all of your communications and start talking about founders because your ideal audience identifies in that way. Fantastic question. That's not a plant, by the way, folks. <laughs> I'm so grateful, Allison, for your return. Bye, everybody. Thank you for your time. Keep putting good into the world. We need more, more of you. More, more.